Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fast Money Football. I'm your host, Albert Vartanian, joined by the one and only James Sharman. And it's a match day edition of Fast Money. Canada takes on Panama in Panama for their World Cup qualifying match. This is the last one of the qualification cycle. And yes, the job of getting into the World Cup is done. But John Herdman says there's still one thing left to do, and that's finish at the top of the group. One point is all they need to do that. But there's also a chance to get into pot three, James, of the World Cup draw, which basically means they can get a slightly better draw. A win against Panama would put them into pot three. So, James, fortunately, this game isn't just a watch. There's actually something to play for, uh, at least on the Canadian side. And, you know, finishing top is clearly a goal of theirs. But how much do you think getting into pot three will play into John Herdman's thinking? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Um, there's so many variables here, you know, one of which is, yeah, he wants to play some young players, too. You know, he'd love to get E.K. Ugba out there. He'd love to get, uh, you know, Ishmael Kony out there. Maybe uh, Christian Gutierrez, younger players. Now, part of that is because he's promised, I'm sure, clubs that unless it's a must win, he won't play all those players in three out of three games, right? Nurturing those club relationships in international football is part of the manager's job. You do want upsets, you know, certain teams because you just burnt their players out. But it is a, a big game now suddenly, you know, um, more so for me for the ego of the group because being in pot three just sounds better than pot four, right? And that <laughs> makes the whole, the whole, you know, World Cup qualifying narrative, you know, even better, right? Oh, first place in CONCACAF, not even a pot four team. But when you look at the actual pots, I don't think there's a big difference between pot three and, and pot four, right? So right now in pot three, guarantee you got Iran, Japan, Morocco, Serbia, Poland, South Korea, um, you know, Senegal, Tunisia, Cameroon might get in there. And pot four, you got Ecuador, good team, Saudi Arabia, Ghana, you know, and, and you could see, of course, the UEFA playoff winner getting in there. They'll be in there as well in pot four. So honestly, it's a kind of a wash. Maybe three's a little bit stronger than four, mm -hmm. but I'm just kind of past all that stuff. You know, we've discussed this before, Albert on camera and off camera. I don't care. I just want to see the team in the World Cup, you know, and, and it's hopefully with, with a couple of really good teams to shine a spotlight on this team. So um, it means something, I guess, and that will motivate the players and certainly John Herbin will motivate his players saying, listen, this is not a nothing game. But in the big picture, I don't think it's that important. No, and I'm with you. And if you look at some of the teams in part two, you're going to get Mexico, maybe the States, which well, they can't draw, but Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Uruguay, Germany? Switzerland. So it doesn't really matter where you finish. You're still probably going to get two massive teams. And obviously in pot one, you have the big guys, you know, Brazil, Belgium, France, Argentina, England, Spain, Portugal. Uh, yeah, it's nice to be in pot three, but I don't really think it's going to make that a world of a difference. It really depends on how the balls fall. And you can either get a really good draw, quote unquote, good draw or a tough one. Uh, with all that in mind, when it comes to his starting 11, where does he go? I know he likes to tweak it. He doesn't seem to like to play maybe a Tiba Hutchinson in back-to-back -back games if he starts, so we could see him in this one. I think there's a few players that'll probably stick. I think Estacchio, maybe David Buchanan, Adekube, who had a really good game. But other than that, I think it's very difficult to predict who he's going to put out there. Yeah, the back in particular is interesting, right? Johnston didn't start the last game. Came on, I can see him starting in this one. Will they, will they get Stephen Vittoria some minutes, having missed the first two games through injury? Um, Daniel Henry started last time. Kennedy played just the one game so far. So there's some options there, absolutely. I'd love to see E.K. Ugbo get a chance to start up front. He's playing really well for Troy, right, in, in France right now. Um, and, and I don't see both J David and Laren starting again in, in this game. Nice options off the bench for sure. I can see him resting one of those players. Um, but, you know, it is a chance to blood some youngsters, right? Or, or at least less experienced players who haven't got caps too many caps so far. How fun would it be to see Ishmael Kone start in this one? Yeah. Right? I mean, I want to see that. Of all the players, I want to see him start a game because what we've seen so far in Montreal is great. And when he came on the field in that first game against Costa Rica, he was fun. He didn't look in the least bit intimidated. He was going at players. He was passing the ball beautifully. He's the one guy I want to see tonight, you know, in, in more than just a 15-minute you know, cameo. Yeah, he didn't look intimidated, especially in that atmosphere. And when it comes to atmosphere... I don't think there's going to be a similar one in Panama, considering Panama already eliminated. Uh, it was a huge disappointment for their fans and obviously for the team and the players not making the World's Cup because that was their goal to finish at least in the top four uh, to progress to the next stage. I'm not sure what the atmosphere is going to be like. I don't know if there's going to be a full stadium. 
because of the disappointment. So this can really play into Canada's advantage, even with a heavily rotated side, because we've talked about this before, but one of Canada's strengths is their depth and, and the flexibility in which Herdman has with his starting 11. Panama, obviously a difficult place to play. And if you look at their home form, they haven't lost. Three wins, three draws. They beat USA there. They drew Mexico nil-nil. So it's going to be a tough game, but I think it would have been a lot tougher if Panama actually had something to play for. And the thing about the Central American teams is that, they, yeah, it's a fervent fan base and they love their teams when they're playing well. Yeah. When they're not, they kind of bitch their teams, right? We saw that with Honduras. When Canada played Honduras, I know it was like a weird election week as well. It was all going, a lot of intangibles there, but they, they didn't really support the team like they had in the past. It wasn't that intimidating. Although John Herbin kind of chastised me a little bit when I mentioned that. He goes, actually, it was pretty tough, right? It wasn't easy, and I'm, I'm, I get that. But it wasn't what you know we've seen in the past. So maybe with this team having failed to qualify for the World Cup, Panama and their fans are kind of like, you know, this is get this over and done with, which really helps, helps, you know, this Canadian team. And even entering this tournament, we thought Panama were a good team, not a great team. Had yeah. question marks, you know, they, they weren't perhaps the Panama of a couple of years ago now. So we, we, we shouldn't be that surprised. I really feel like this Canadian team has crossed that bridge in terms of being intimidated about traveling away to these, these uh, Central American stadiums. I think they're past that. I think they've grown. I think they, they actually thrive when they go to these places and they want to play in tough conditions. And I think that all comes from John Herdman. So now they're going into a place where they're expected to win. I mean, if you look at their odds, plus 110 uh, to Panama's, I think plus 270. Pretty good odds on Canada to win. Uh, so the bookies see them as a favorite. I also see them as a favorite. When it comes to betting, I don't mind throwing down the plus 110 on Canada. But I think if you are going to bet on this game, probably wait for the starting eleven to see uh, what kind of team is being put out there. Do you any, is there yeah. anything you like in terms of betting for this game? Well, the fact that the fact that Canada's on the road in CONCACAF in a World Cup qualifier against a decent team and, and their favorites just shows how far they've gone. So I like that as well. You know, with or without, you know, I think, you know, the depth was shown so far in qualifying. Whoever they put in the field, it's going to be a strong team and players looking to prove themselves. We're at the point now, Albert, I think, where players are fighting for positions. And they want to be in John Herman's mind when it comes right. to the next windows of, of friendlies and, of course, leading into Qatar. It's going to be suddenly a battle to make that 23-man squad. It might be a 25-man squad. There's still discussions about will they increase the, the squads for this World Cup. But say it's 23, there's going to be some decent talent left out. And we probably will be introduced to some players we haven't, haven't even thought of yet over the coming months, which is really interesting. So, uh, yeah, plus 110, I think, is it, really decent. And, uh, you know, listen... Like I said, it just it, it just blows my mind that that we're talking about Canada being a favorite on the road in CONCACAF. I mean, it's been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, how times have changed. But, you know, John Herbin really put an emphasis on finishing at the top of this group, not only to kind of end qualification on a high, but he made a point of saying it's the perception from, you know, around the football world on what that means. You're finishing ahead of Mexico and the USA. If they were to finish second or third, the perception would have been like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, Canada finishes below those teams, but now they're finishing above them. It might turn the heads of certain people, even dual nationals who Herdman is looking at yeah. to bring in. So I think the importance of finishing at the top of the group is not only to finish this qualification on a high, but what it means for the future, even heading into this World Cup. I think it's a great point. I think Canada's becoming a destination now because, okay, number one, yes, they're a good team, uh, but also they're going to be in World Cups. You know, How much fun will it be to play for Canada yeah. in a World Cup in Canada? in four years time, right? That's fun. You know, that's a real character dangle in front of, uh, you know, guys questioning whether they should or whether they shouldn't. And then moving forward, we said before, 48 team World Cups, you know, more births from CONCACAF. This this team should qualify for World Cups from this point onwards. What a huge carrot that is. That's yeah. amazing. And I know that they're looking around the world right now. They've got a couple of players in England right now who are really thinking about switching to Canada. Um, that there's going to be some names, I think, in the next little while. Young players as well, not just, you know, grizzled veterans. These are guys that, that can grow with this team. And the, the kind of the feeling within Canada and the CSA is that this, this wave beneath this current wave is even better. And that's wonderful, right? That's really exciting. Yeah, John Herbman was on the CBC Legends show, which was hosted by two people you know really well, Brendan Dunlop and Craig Forrest. He uh, told a story about when he talked to Daniil Henry, and Henry was talking about his Canadian passport. They were talking about the value of the Canadian passport in world football, specifically in Europe, and how Daniil Henry would get laughed at because he was Canadian 
<laughs> and he would make one mistake in a game or in training, and he'd be kicked out of the team for a couple of weeks. And he mentioned that, you know, an England player can make five or six mistakes, and that wouldn't happen. So I think it's so important that Canada finishes the top of this group and go into the World Cup and don't fill up the numbers and actually go there and perform for more reasons than just being a team that's able to get to the World Cup. I mean, it's it's unbelievable what's happening with this Canadian team, and it all comes back to John Herdman. I've read uh, you know numerous articles from overseas saying you know Canada might be the story of qualifying. Yeah, probably are the story, and they can really capture I think the hearts of the neutrals entering this World Cup because they are so likable, right? They're a nice bunch of guys. They got charisma. You know, they're gonna. I hope they're gonna just sell Alfonso Davies. Um, they're gonna obviously sell John Herbman. You know, and I really hope they just push them you know, to all the media outlets around the world, you know, so everyone knows who this team is. Every, every World Cup, this one team is the darling of the tournament. And I think it can be Canada, right? Yeah. Maybe it's just for three games, but you can still be the darling, right? Remember North Macedonia, Euro, right? They, they, were a, they played nice football, right? They got some results. They did okay. And people thought, man, this team's a surprise. I love that. You know, the Canada can be <laughs> yeah. that team. Who knows? They can be Cameroon 1990. They could get through to the knockout phase, you know, and blow the minds of the, the global footballing audience. Yeah, everybody likes an under, un, underdog story. Remember Hungary yeah. in the group of death, I think, at the Euros, right? People wanted them to see, see what they can do, get out of that group against yeah, the group of death. Yeah, difference being Hungary had this, this dark edge to them, you know, in the fans. Yeah. You know, the ultras. Canada hasn't got that. We've got these no. wonderfully naive the fans who have no idea it's a world cup what they know they're football but they're just going to be so happy the voyagers yeah. will take that world cup by storm they really will right and, and i think they're going yeah. to see a lot of you know town squares with red shirts on broadcast around the world now that's that off the field off away from the team canada story is one to follow as well yeah such an exciting time but before we end this canadian chat i think we need to hit up this uh world cup 2022 group stage draw simulator james let's see what we get <laughs> I just okay. want to do it once. All right. Okay. Canada, Group B, Belgium, Croatia, and Tunisia. I would, John Herbman would jump all over that one. That's all not right. a bad one. Belgium, Belgium, you know, the golden generations in decline. You know, they, they lost recently, actually. Not, not what they once were, but still star power. Isn't it um, unbelievable that team hasn't won a, a trophy? It's and one of those things, right? You know, there's not many tournaments to win, right? It's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Croatia's aging. Croatia would be a nice draw, I think. The way yeah. Canada plays as well, you know, with their pace, their counter. Uh, and, Tunisia. and then Tunisia. I know nothing about Tunisia. I won't lie to you. I will do by the draw time on Friday, but they're not a powerhouse, <laughs> put it that way. Um, so, yeah, you know, if that's the draw, I'll, I'll take it. I want to see I want to see Brazil, Germany, Canada, and Ecuador. Imagine that. That's a group of death oh right there. Goodness. Yeah, and you know what? It can happen. It can happen. The, the, the fact that you know, a team like Germany is in pot two with the likes of Denmark and Netherlands. By the way, I hope we don't get Netherlands or excuse me, Denmark, because anyone who plays Denmark is already the most hated team in the world because yep. you want to see them. That story. He scored you again. Want to see them thrive, you know? He scored again, Albert, yesterday, Christian oh, Eriksen. My goodness. In the stadium where he almost I know. died. I know. What an incredible story of, you know, I want to say redemption because, you know, but uh, yeah, it, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, let's get to that. Christian Eriksen, 200. And 90 days later, Erickson returns to the stadium where he collapsed. He actually died for a little bit and came back, James. He captained his country and he scored a goal. Definitely one of the best comeback stories ever. We keep mentioning if he can come back and be, you know, it's 70% of the player that he was, he's still going to be very good. But now the way I see him playing, it looks like he's taking nothing for granted. He's taking advantage of every moment. So now I'm like, could he actually be better? I wonder. Yeah, maybe. Maybe he's playing looser, right? He, he understands that football isn't everything. There's far more important things in this world. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, he, he had a bit of a comeback with Inter Milan, but had a couple of years there where he wasn't quite the same player we saw at Spurs. No. And now he's moved to Brentford. Um, and he's, you know, I mean, he's still, we, we laughed about it, haven't we, on this show, how crazy it is that Christian Eriksen is playing for Brentford. <laughs> but I mean, if he's going to carry that form into the Premier League stretch run, I mean, how important is that for Brentford? And yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe he's just playing so loose because he understands it's not the end of the world. You know, a result isn't everything. And that's a pretty dangerous player because two games, two goals, good goals as well. Yeah. Um, and, and just seeing, you know, the the before the match yesterday when they brought him out and they gave him that little uh, award, um, it was pretty emotional, wasn't it? I mean, man, we discussed how we'd feel when he returned and, and it was a little bit uneasiness with, with Brentford. 
But now he's played a few games. Now he's done it for Denmark. I'm feeling a lot more comfortable watching him play. Yeah, he looks a lot happier. And uh, yeah, it's just great to see him play. Great to see him out there. And he keeps mentioning, he's like, yeah, I'm going to go through. It's going to be emotional. I'm going to get the ovation. But, you know, after people are going to realize I'm just another guy on the pitch and we can move on. I think that's what he wants as well. I think he's ready to move on. But I think he also understands, you know, uh, the importance of him being out there and what it means, not only for him, but for everyone else that's watching. Some other news and notes, James. Laser pointers. Uh, if you didn't see it, Senegal and Egypt played yesterday. Senegal beat them in a penalty shootout. Once again, eliminating Egypt, Senegal going to the World Cup. Senegal fans used laser pointers during the penalty shootout. If you watched it, it was unbelievable. There was like 30 or 40 on the Egyptian players' faces and the keeper. They missed three kicks and they lost. What do you think of that? Yeah, that, that image of Mo Salah before he misses his penalty. Oh, my just God. Being, he's like the Hulk. You know, he's just green. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean... They're not allowed to bring those things in. There must be a way, I think, to, to control that. But I guess they bring flares in. They get those in too. You can sneak them up. God knows how. I don't even want to know how they sneak them in. You know, <laughs> use your imagination. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand. I know um, Egypt, the Federation, have complained to FIFA about it. And, and so they should. They won't get a, you know, the game replayed, obviously. But um, yeah, awful way to, to lose on penalties and then oh to face God. that as well. And it's tough for Mo Salah. However... I'm sure, speaking for Liverpool fans, if he re-signs, um, having a nice rested Mo Salah in January isn't the worst thing in the world for, for that team next year. <laughs> no, not at all. He's being linked everywhere right now. Barcelona, I Real know. Madrid. Just find the contract. Do you know what? He's, he's got it so good at Liverpool. He'll be an absolute legend forever at that yeah. club if he stays there. You know, and yeah. I understand... You know, he's asking for what he deserves. He's arguably the best player in world football in form right now, but he's also, you know, 30. And, uh, you know, we saw what happened with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang when he signed that big contract at Arsenal. Of course, we're seeing what he's doing now at Barcelona. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Liverpool can, can pay him more than anyone on their club, but they have a, a wage structure as well. They can't break to a certain point. So it's, it's a tricky one for both sides. I, I understand both parties, to be honest with you. Yeah, and if there's a team that does good business, it's definitely Liverpool. Uh, Leonardo, Leonardo Bonucci, he had some things to say about the World Cup qualifying system. As everyone knows, Italy bumped out of the World Cup by North Macedonia. He said everything was decided in just one game. It's absurd. Other teams were able to lose four or five games and qualify. We can see it at the 92nd minute and it's over. It's pure madness. Is this just a, a salty Bonucci or does he have a point here? Nice. Yeah, salty Bonucci. Is, you, you know the situation. You didn't play well enough in the group phase. You know, you blew it to Switzerland. You're a better team. You're European champions. You played the best football I've seen in a long time at Euro. Then what happened oh to God. all that? You know, yeah. you took your foot off the gas and, and it's your own fault. I mean, we can talk about qualifying in the process. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it overall. I mean, I heard someone, um, a, a well-renowned journalist, suggest that maybe a global type of qualification is the way to go, which I actually quite like. But mm -hmm. I posed that question to uh, CONCACAF president Vitor Montaliani this week. And he said, yeah, he'd heard that before, but the issue is logistics and travel, which is understandable as well, I suppose. So, you know, it's, it's not ideal, but what do you want? You know, it's a one-off. It's, it's North Macedonia. And as much as I championed them earlier in this show, I mean, it's North Macedonia. You're the European champions. You, you dominated that game. You couldn't find the goal. You were yeah. unfortunate, perhaps, but you've only yourselves to blame. You know, and I think Bonucci's probably realizing his international career is done. And although Mancini's come out and said that, you know, he's not leaving, he's going to stick around, and so he should. But it's just still staggering to me that Italy are missing back-to-back -back World Cups. And that, that question is being, what do you think, Albert? I mean, would you, would you take two failures to qualify for a World Cup if it meant that you won a European championship in between? Oh, man. That's difficult. I mean, it's definitely a high winning that Euro. But you want to be in the World Cup. I don't know if, I don't know if you can replace one for another. I mean, if it's... Win the Euro or miss out on the World Cup? I, you probably take the Euro to be completely I think so honest. too. It's but tough. It's just, Italy's, it's just a situation. The last World Cup game, James, June 15th, 2014, was our last group stage game. The last <laughs> knockout game, July 9th, 2006, the final against France. That's, that's crazy, isn't it? Unbelievable for wow. Italy. I also I think, I think I've mentioned this to you already, if you win the Euro, you should just... Go right into yeah. I think it should be. I agree. The, World Cup. I the same thing your, with the African Cup of Nations. Same with the Gold Cup. Yes, right. Just if you're a confederation champion, you yeah. should be given that. That should be the the reward. I mean, how how important would the Gold Cup now suddenly become? Right. Oh, I know. If I mean that's great. You wouldn't be seeing these B teams we've been seeing the last you know couple of times. 
right? Just trying testing things out. Oh no, this is legit. This is important. Let's win this thing. I think that'd be fantastic. But you know right. what, James? It won't even matter once they expand the uh, the the teams. No, it won't. I know. Next I mean, everyone can get in. And even <laughs> like you know, with with Concacaf hosting the next World Cup, you know, so three of them should be in anyway. So yeah. what, you give it to the fourth place team because they're the three. I, I don't know. Anyway, I I I think that's a great idea. But I mean, from Italy once again, I, I had them as my favourites for the World Cup coming out of Euro because of the way they played. Yeah. And they're not even going to be there. I mean, it's one of the the great stories. And uh, you know oddities, I think of of sport in, in recent memory. Italy out, Canada in. Who would have predicted that? Not even Nostradamus. Okay, finally <laughs> for England, Harry Maguire booed by England fans in a friendly yesterday against Ivory Coast. They won three nil. He was booed and whistled when his name was announced prior to the game. I'm not sure where I am with this one. I don't know if I disagree with the fans or agree. Where are you at? I think here? it's pathetic. Yeah, it's pathetic. Right when when they put that England shit on, right? You you. you Peel away any club allegiances. I don't care if they're United fans or Liverpool fans. You know, I don't care. You know, you're an England fan, right? And this guy's had a tough season. Of course he has, but he's always played pretty well for England. It's not as if he's had terrible games for England. Now, we can debate whether he should have been picked by Gareth Southgate based on form. And obviously on form, he shouldn't have been. But he's got so much experience. And Southgate said, listen, we cannot win championships with guys with two and three caps. You need to have the experience. And I don't think Harry Maguire has ever let down his country or very rarely let down his country. So we can debate whether he should be picked him up. But you don't boo the guy. You should be supporting your team. It's before the match, for crying out loud, right? Support yeah. the team. I think it's a there's that nasty, seeded edge to English soccer fans. Not all of them. The majority are decent human beings, I think. I'm one of them, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. there's that element, right? Which who just aren't very nice human beings, and uh, they take yeah. this too seriously. This is where you're going to get from fans, though, right? I mean, there's a side of it where I think, well, you know, fans can they can sp- express themselves how they feel as long as it's not malicious. So I understand that side of it. I mean, you had fans in PSG booing Lionel Messi, and so you're going to get you're going to get those small pockets. I don't think it was you know the entire stadium no. of Wembley booing no. him. I think it was just a small pocket. And let's not forget, Harry Maguire was in the team of the tournament for Euro 2020, one of the best players. So, yeah, he may not be on form for Manchester United. He's been really poor, to be completely honest with you. But when he puts on that England shirt, some players, when they put on their country's shirt, they just play so much better. It's just that They're feeling. Human beings, that. too, right? The human beings are crying exactly. out. We and social that. media has a huge part to play in this as well. Yeah, absolutely, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just really sad that it happens in modern sport. I mean, listen, booze is one thing. Obviously, there's another element, you know, which is far, far worse. Yeah. Uh, that, that seedy underbelly. We saw that at Euro with the black players, you know. When, when Reem Sterling is, is dominating like he did yesterday, I don't see any, any hate. Like, where are you now? You know, losers. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's, we're going to see it in the World Cup, you know. Sadly, it's just modern culture, right? It really is this, this mob mentality. We see it either on social media or now in the stadiums. It's going to be there, unfortunately. But um, I guess, like I said, booing is one thing. It's not that hateful, but I think it's just very unpleasant and unnecessary. Yeah, back your players, I think, is something that everyone needs to do, especially when it comes to your country. Because, you know, I think people forget when when, when players are down and when teams are down, they need us. They need the fans yep. to help them. And I think people forget that. But that's it for Fast Money Football. Let's go to the positive. Canada taking out Panama. Big win today. We'll get them into pot three, but a draw finish the finish, will finish them off at the top of the CONCACAF group, which becomes the kings of CONCACAF, James, which is hard to believe. But for James Sharman, I'm Albert Vartanian. Make sure you check out parlay.tv for more parlay content. Thanks for watching.